All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really nice to be back to the IAS show. It's been actually a while since I've been here and it's very nice to be able to come back as a speaker. Franco, who's actually not here, um, had called me and asked if I would speak on a more serious topic actually tonight. So I don't wanna be a total Debbie Downer, but it's on plant smuggling and plant theft. And I will be the first to admit I am not an expert in this field, but it is something that um, they felt very strongly that th they wanted to hear uh, tonight. So I will be weaving in some stories. And I also shared with them as a disclaimer that it's not all going to be aeroid related. So <laughs> it'll be giving a bit more of a broader perspective, but at least it will help us maybe shed some light for us to critically think about what our role is in this as like plant lovers, plant collectors, plant purveyors, plant scientists, plant researchers and the like, because I think that we all should play a role and sometimes we like to look at a plant and we love it and we don't really think much more beyond that. And so the, the ability to be able to philosophize about it a little bit more and understand our role and our responsibility I think is always a good thing. Before I do that, however, I would like to give you a little bit, a bit of a backgrounder and update on my own life. I mean, many of you may already know me, maybe through YouTube, maybe not. Um, most of you probably here don't know me all that well. Uh, so I'll just share some personal stories and then I'll try to loop those stories into the topic du jour of today. So most of you will know that I have lived in Brooklyn in my very verdant apartment for almost 20 years now. And almost three years ago to this date, my friends and I ended up purchasing 90 acres in the Finger Lakes region of New York. So people who are not familiar with like the northern part of this uh, <laughs> great United States. It's in the south central part. It's like these 11 fingers that like come down and it's a really beautiful area. I mean, if anybody's a geology nerd, you would love this place because the waterfalls, the gorges are just beautiful. The last glacial retreat came through about 20,000 years ago, 14 to 20,000 years ago, and it's left a very interesting landscape and land. So for folks who actually like to go out in the wild and actually see some really cool things, there's a lot that is there. Now perhaps, not ironically, the land that we got used to be an old nursery, believe it or not. So fate would have it. It was not an aeroid nursery, unfortunately, but the gentleman who had run it uh, specialized in unique conifers and Japanese maples. And then he kind of moved out into more pedestrian and native plants and horticultural variety, varieties. And there's some people here that are, is in the horticultural trade and, and what most people won't tell you is that nurseries are very resource intensive. And when we were there, they started, they were already disassembling like all the greenhouses and they started to remove massive amounts of trash out of the ground. I mean, they removed 32 tons of trash even before we got there. And then we got there, and then we, the nine acres that you kind of see that was this old nursery, we started removing 64 tons of trash. We removed thousands of these invasive bushes that were moving in. And they told us actually that they had put 100,000 tons of gravel on top of this. But below that was like these geotextile materials and like tile drainage pushing up from the bottoms. I mean, it was crazy. So when we got there, we were like, we need to do something about this. So we ended up, because um, we weren't going to run the nursery as, as it was. I mean, we might eventually run a nursery, but I don't know if it was going to be at that scale. And so we were like, we want to revivify this land. We want to restore the land to maybe something that it was. It was probably forest at some point, but we wanted to meadowize it basically. And that was our, um, our task. And I think that that's something that I really, uh, you know, it's actually one of the things that I thought I was going to go on track in, in university to do that was actually reclaiming land. But I will say that that's a lot of energy to go and reclaim or restore a land or, or, or plants back into a land. One of the things is, is if you can maintain it to a certain degree or conserve it, that's, that's a little less resource intensive. So as much as I like to see the transformation happening, um, this, is what it, this is what it is. So I, I'll play you like a quick one minute video of just you showing how it all came together.
much labor, but it's such a labor of love. One fact that you might not know about me, unless like you read or you picked up my book from How to Make a Plant Love You or, or not, is that actually I grew up in coal mining country up in Pennsylvania, and actually my great-grandfather was a coal miner. And uh, I did a lot of in, uh, ecological restoration of coal mines. Actually, that was my first job as a teenager, was actually doing the planting plans in areas that were heavily coal mined. And those are really difficult areas in order to be able to get back to the wildlife and the uh, nature that you must once had there. So that was on the track that I was going to go towards you know, in, in university. And I went on an entirely different track, which has no consequence to the people here, so I'm not even going to mention it. But even though I'm not doing that professionally, personally, it is, to me, the most satisfying and fulfilling work. I mean, that is something that I absolutely love. And I love growing plants indoors, but there is something about getting back that ecological services and restoration and seeing the bug life and the bird life and the wildlife. I mean, when we restored that meadow, I saw my first bobolink come to the meadow. And for people who don't know birds, a bobolink is a very declining meadow bird. And because we don't have meadows and we don't have a lot of meadow areas. And when I saw that, I was like, oh my god, a bobolink. And I was like, it's like, oh my god, that's the reason why you do it. And I think that those are the things, too. Then when we think about plants, and we think about plants are the foundation of our ecosystem. They're, and they are the foundation of you know, life on the planet. And so having those little moments and realizing that even some of the plants that you may have had a life maybe even before that or are part of this other natural history web of life, that is so satisfying. And being able to engage in that and to learn a little bit more of the natural history of the plant and where it kind of grew up and where it's from, those are the things that I think I delight and I hope that you delight in as well. But this was very, um, such a wonderful experience for me because what I wanted to do with that meadow is turn it into what I would call an insect meadow. And for those of you who may or may not be aware, we're going through an insect apocalypse, maybe you've uh, heard about that, is that our insects are just dying left and right. And I think part of it is because of this habitat degradation. It's removing plants, whether we know it or not, out of the landscape. And, and, um, and we also have a, a declining amount of birds. And those insects and birds really do go hand in hand. And so what I'll describe to you is like 96% of our songbird species here in the United States rely on insects. So those birds that we have at the feeder, you know, that's only like a small little percentage of birds. 96% of our birds actually rely on insects for to feed their broods or anything like that. I think chickadees, it's like two to 3,000 um, caterpillar in order to raise their broods. So if we're not growing those native plants that insects eat, then we don't have any baby birds and we don't have any of those insects. So this is one of our goals, personal goals on the land and the pursuit feels to me like more of a noble cause. And that transformation of that meadow for me is something that really crystallizes what we want to do there. So I am personally interested in introducing or perhaps like reintroducing native species of plants because we just don't know, always know or flat on a, unaware of what native organisms really rely on those plants. We just don't know the functions that they provide, the services that we provide, and by removing them out of the landscape, we're changing them. Now, this is, uh, <laughs> This is my little aeroid break because how many of you are northerners here? How many lived up north? OK, OK. So and then people maybe zone seven or below, colder. Yeah. Some people who grow plants indoors are like, what is a zone? <laughs> you only grow plants indoors. No, zone seven or below, cold climates. We have aeroids too. <laughs> and um, one of the plant, some of the plants that we're starting to reestablish on the land are something like this. So shout it out. Who knows what it is? Yes, what, what species? Oh, no, this is, honey, this is, this is New York native right here. <laughs> no, close. Same genus, same genus. I know you guys are all subtropical, tropical, aroid, you know. All right, I got you, I got you. But he, he got closest to the, uh, the genus. Um, this is Dracontium. Erysima dracontium, or green dragon. Somebody already said this one. That's a jack in the pulpit. Erysima trifilum. This is another one that we're restoring onto the land. 
This one tripped me up. I saw this on the land. I had no idea what it was. All right, let's see if you guys are going to get it. What? No, we have no syngoniums, unfortunately, in New York. <laughs> Anyone? Yes! Who is that? Obscure! Yes, very good. I feel like I, sh I should have gotten like candies that I should throw to everything. Yeah, Peltandra virginica. It's like, see that it's growing in the water. It's one of the kind of ones that grow on the interstitial. Somebody already mentioned this one. Uh, this is a, a kind of a unique one. Skunk cabbage, yes, this is uh, Simplocarpus phytitis. Really cool aeroid that grows in the, around marshy areas. You often see it around streams and things like that. This is one of the things that aeroids do, right? It starts to heat up, it gets really hot. So this is in the winter, you'll start to see these skunk cabbages start sticking out of the snow and Something that I was flabbergasted, I didn't know this. Do you know what, there's a lot of things that actually pollinate this, but they have, it has a really unusual pollinator. Does anybody know? Skunk. <laughs> not, not quite, I mean, it, it smells like a skunk, that's where it's got its name, but yeah, unusual, it's an insect, I'll give, it to, I'll give that to you. Anybody know? Mosquito is actually a good uh, guess. It's related, not related to a mosquito, but it has a similar life like a mosquito. A stonefly. Does anyone know what stoneflies are? They're an aquatic insect, which is part of the reason why I said other mosquitoes, because mosquitoes spend part of their life under underwater. A stonefly, and I went to school for aquatic entomology, and I never knew that story. A stonefly is like a little plectopteran, like just a, like a dragonfly or damselfly. It'll spend its life underwater and start to emerge. And what they found is that when these start to heat up, that stonefly starts to wake up and come out because it's around the, the water areas. And they found tons of stoneflies on these pollinating them. So that was a really unusual thing for aeroids. Like typically you see like beetles and bees and things along those lines, but not usually stoneflies. So this just gives you an example of like the things that we just don't know. Like when we take something out of the environment or we remove it or we decide not to grow it or anything like that, the, those interactions I just think are are just amazing to me, especially when you actually find something like that out. It seems like so insignificant, so little, but then when you find it, it's like, oh, that's amazing. So speaking of pollinators, uh, I became very focused on specialist pollinators and have a pollinator garden that we put in two years ago. It's pictured here. And it really emphasizes native and specialist plants. Now, what are specialist pollinators? These are pollinators that rely strictly on either a family, a genus, or a species of plant to fulfill their entire life cycle. So if they don't have that plant, that, that insect, that pollinator is absolutely gone. And that has happened by removing certain plants out of our landscape, that has actually happened. So here are a couple examples I'll give you. I'll give you the aeroid stuff later uh, down this talk, but this will give you an idea of the delicate co-evolution that really has occurred between species and how easy it is is for like us humans to just like go and screw it up. So this is a, a plant, I don't think this reaches down to Florida. Does anybody know what this is? This is hookara. Does anybody grow hookara as a bedding plant? Okay, yes. Yeah, who, yeah, coral bells. Cor coral bells, alum root it's called. It grows, I think, I think it just kind of peters out in the Georgia area, so sorry Florida people. This is a heavily cultivated plant. You, you have like colors of, um, of pinks and oranges and reds and all that type of stuff on the leaves. So you find this, but you can never find Hoopra Americana in the trade. I wouldn't say never, because I found it, but like you have to get to a specialty grower. And the funny thing is Mount Cuba Center in Delaware started doing a ton of research and they found this population of this little bee, Coletis acetivalis. This bee only pollinates Hoopra Americana. It does not pollinate any of those pretty cultivars. So this population of bee went totally kaput, or at least they thought about thought it until they actually found it around the Hookera Americana and found that the native ours or the cultivars that people are planting in their gardens just doesn't support this. And this was like kind of an important thing because this is only one little example, but if you kind of pull it out to like just the United States alone, uh, around I think it's around 40% of our bees are actually specialist bees. And in New York State alone, that's where I'm from, 
25% of our bees are, uh, are specialists. So they're not like honeybees. Generalists are like honeybees and bumblebees, those types of things. And 60% of them are threatened or endangered. So it, it's so easy for us to make the choice of going like, I want that cultivar, and then just removing it from the garden and then everything else that is attached to that actually removes. This is another interesting one because in, in an aeroid world, you have these little resins um, or extra flora nectaries. This is an example of a specialist pollinator plant, but it's not related to the pollen. It's related to a resin. So this is Lysimachia quadrifolia. We have Lysimachia ciliata. And this bee, the Macropsis, actually uses that resin to harvest into their brood chambers. And so if that Lysimachia is not there, that bee is not actually uh, producing any young. So these are just really simple examples that uh, we just started to uh, you, you know, research and started to put into our gardens. And hey, maybe they're not the prettiest flower or the biggest bloom, but the, the fact that we are seeing tons of more pollinators uh, out there, just it, 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 I can't tell you how much it makes my heart like soar. <laughs> it's just so fantastic. So basically, we started highlighting some more of these like ecological stewardship topics on Flock on a YouTube channel. And that's obviously wasn't my first rodeo. I started Plant One On Me about maybe seven years ago now. And that's how maybe some of you have got into plants. I have a lot of folks who have come up to me and say, hey, you know, I got into plants because I saw Plant One On Me or anything along those lines. And that was absolutely marvelous to be able, I did not know it would be taking off at all. What happened was, this was the image that actually went viral back in April of 2016. So a woman came over to take a picture of my worms that were in, uh, in my vermicomposting bin under my sink in Brooklyn. And when she came in, she was just flabbergasted the amount of plants. And she's like, did anybody ever you know, highlight your plant house? And I said, well, yes. Nobody really like, thought anything of it. And, and then she said, well, I would like to take a few photos. And I said, sure. So she ran this in Modern Farmer, and within a week, I had 50 million people who had viewed my house. I, I was not expecting it at all. I had direct messages and Facebook posts and everything from me, like, how do you take care of your plants? Where did you get this? Blah, blah. And so I was like, oh my god, I, I, I'm going to create a YouTube channel. It took me a while to actually do that. It was probably a year afterwards. And I honestly really didn't think starting a YouTube channel was that big of an idea, uh, of an idea either. Um, I would say that you think everything exists on YouTube, but there were some houseplant channels on YouTube. I was definitely the first millennial to put a houseplant channel up, and I think that actually resonated with uh, an, an age group, you know, really, that uh, was living differently, was living in apartments and didn't have maybe an outdoor or backyard space. And this really resonated with folks. And I think it, it resonated with folks for so many different reasons. And like I said, I didn't think it was really that big of a, an idea or, idea or deal until I got a call from Adweek. And they wanted to get a quote from me for a report that Google Trends wrote. And I was like, well, I don't know what that report is. I didn't see it. And I asked them to send it to me. And it was ultimately this, and it said four in five people say that digital video helps them learn new things. Okay, yeah, you want to unclog your toilet, you go to YouTube or somewhere else. You want to find a good restaurant, you go to TikTok. But they said a quirky way we've seen the passion for learning come to life is through something called PlantTube. Daily views of videos related to houseplants increased 60% last year on YouTube thanks to creators like Summer Rain Oaks, who are champions of this thriving community of home horticulturalists. So Adweek wanted to say that you know, their search results went through the roof. And they started to look at it on YouTube, because all of a sudden people are looking for houseplants, 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 summer's apartment, houseplants. And it was insane. And I was like, well, this is actually a, a big deal. Like, this is actually reaching people. And that, you start to feel a sense of like maybe responsibility that comes with it. Now, I know correlation is not causation. I'm going to stress that. But I'm going to show you an, uh, an interesting graph. This is the trend of houseplant sales. And this era of houseplant sales is often compared to the interest of houseplants in 1970. And I think, Ron, you were actually mentioning this in dinner last night, because I think you brought it up randomly about like the 1970s. And you're like, no, it's more, 1970s was more about just awareness. 
And it's true, like in 1970, you had Earth Day, and you had this starting, you get awareness of plants, and we had some really great books like back in the 1970s. I mean, some of you have lived through it. I have some of those great like 1970s, they're a little cheesy, but like great 1970s like plant books that really came out, and they're just so charming, and, but you could see that this little graph right here is just infinitesimal. Correlation is not causation, but I'm going to say this is when my channel launched. <laughs> and, then, and, then, uh, and then after that, there were so many other channels that came. I mean, it, did, it took like six months and the second channel was up. Um, and, and then you had this graph, unfortunately, ends a little bit too soon, I think. But then you get the pandemic. You'll probably see another little, little tiny hockey stick kind of going up and then with the advent of the adoption of like TikTok, especially for Gen Zers and everything along those lines, and the pandemic starting, you got a lot more people who had interest in the houseplant market. And what came with that as well, though, unfortunately, is much more plant theft and a much more plant smuggling as well. That's something else that really happened. And the people that I spoke with, like with the IUCN and people on the ground were saying, it was astronomical because a lot of businesses also got shut down. And so a lot of folks in their neighborhoods, wherever they were, turned to plants. Maybe many people started their plant businesses during that time. And, many, and I also got a ton more DMs from people everywhere from like Indonesia to the Philippines saying, hey, I could, uh, I could export plants to you in the market. I, I, didn't even, I, I don't even have a business of plants. I don't sell plants. So it was, re it was really interesting to see this kind of like, underground market kind of grow along with the interest of other people interested, just interested in plants in general. So what I also started to notice when I was producing the channel was more of what I would like personally identify as maybe unhealthy obsessions. <laughs> so, and, and when I say this, I, I want to be clear, like I'm not trying to be like hypercritical of other people because when I see this, I kind of like get step into a space where I'm like, if I acted that, it's more of a reflection of yourself. You're like, if I, if I started doing that in my own life, would I feel like I was myself? You know, would I, would I be like, uh, you know, I, I would, uh, you know, it's like when you're, you're in a relationship with somebody and then you see that person with another person and you feel this jealousy, but like, you're like, I'm not a jealous person. I don't like that. You don't want to move away from that emotion. Well, I, I started to see these like unhealthy obsessions and I was like, well, what am I causing that? Is this like, a, is, should I, you know, step back? And so these are the things again that I'm just reflecting on. And so I'm going to share those with you. And maybe some of these are things that you've reflected on as well. So a great example is I often had people coming up to me and they often say like, you really got me into plants. You know, this is amazing. Like I really found my passion and I love that. I love that because if I had a mission in life, like my mission would be to connect people back to nature. And if houseplants is the hook or the way in, then that's awesome. Because I think that if people get interested in it and they get interested in plants beyond the fact that they're decor or anything along those lines and they get into that natural history and they want to step out into the world and start to push plants out into the wild and everything, that's awesome to me. That's like, that's what it's all about. Sometimes those folks would then go into another frame of mind. They say, you got me into plants, but like, I don't have any, as many plants as you. And then, I, and I felt more like a plant priestess where like somebody's coming as a confession. Like, you know, I only have 300 plants or I only have 600 plants. And I was like, well, this is not good because for me, that's not why I got into plants in the first place. Yeah, I, I had a lot of plants. I, always, I, I pretty much had a lot of plants in Brooklyn and it was a slow grow. You know, it was 20 years of living in one place. It's a slow grow. You start to collect plants. But I didn't, I didn't collect plants just for the sake of collecting plants and having a number on it. And I, and I felt like that was, if I were reflecting on myself, that would be the antithesis of why I would get into plants in the first place. So it was this weird thing. And I think what started it is some of those articles that went viral because it was like, this crazy lady has hundreds of house plants in her house. And I was like, ooh, you know, like, and, it, it, and I gave people permission to be crazy with me, sure, okay. But, um, but at the end of the day, it was like I started to reflect on that. And what I noticed is that when I would, um, you know, do a YouTube video and I would highlight the number of plants, 
I just, it, it didn't feel right anymore. Like, oh, look at my 300 plants that I have in this one room. Like, it, it, it was making me feel like I was making other people feel bad about themselves. And I, I don't have control over that, but it was something that I just kind of noticed. And to me, you know, I love plants. I love plants. They inspire curiosity in me. They keep me grounded. I love the way that I feel when I wake up in the morning and you're surrounded about it, surrounded with them. And, and I started to grow plants in the city because I, had, I felt like I had a lack of them actually outside in the first place. And I know now as I'm starting to push out into the ecosystem and redo that, like the ecosystem connections, you know, doing it for the bugs and the birds and the animals, that's something that really resonates with me. So when I started to see that people would get triggered by like the number of plants, I started to pull that out of my titles altogether. And to the detriment, I think, of the channel, because that is a really thing that get people like, like to click on. And, but I just I didn't feel right anymore about it. And, and you, you have to kind of understand what you want to do as a person, because you might be a content creator yourself, or you might be a journalist. And you, say, and you say, well, I know that gets clicks. And maybe it's just the carrot that you want to bring in to get, get the larger story. That's awesome. These are just reflections that I was doing. Um, another thing that was related to that is I recognized people were using the word rare to trigger other people, and not always in a positive way. So titles like my rarest plant yet, or rare plant alert, or you won't believe what rare plant I bought at some extraordinary amount of money at the IAS show. <laughs> <laughs> and even purveyors were highlighting rare plants. And this, too, for me, was causing like a feeling of inadequacy in folks or eliciting responses in people of like, I have to have that or, I, you know, I wish I could have that. And I love this term that my friend Nitika Chopra always uses. I saw this as like compare and despair syndrome. That's what she calls it, especially, and it's, it's, augmented, it's kind of pressured by the social media pressure as well. And so I started to consciously not use rare so liberally on my channel because I also think it reduces the, the word rare for truly rare plants. I mean, that's another thing that I want I, like, I just think about. So I have used it on occasion, like the rare plant survey in Thailand, and we went up to like the tiger's nose to hike up there, and there's on, on this one rock face, there's this like, utricularia that's there that only exists on that one rock face and it the small trickle of water that might come through actually feeds it and it's just on that rock face so I use the word rare for that that to me is rare and then you know also in flock I used the word rare recently on the, planting this thing called prunus pumula variation depressa which is this kind of prostrate ground cherry and it's a highly uncommon I think it's actually threatened in New York and I wanted to actually promote it because there's a bunch of growers now who are propagating it. And I, I'm, I really love the idea of people taking rarer plants that have a lot of pressure and actually propagating them and doing like nice genetic diversity and people planting them into their landscapes because I think that's one way to make them a little less rare exact, you know, at, at the end of the day. So these are just things that I've noticed. And these are things that you've probably engaged in as well. And I'm not trying to like, Beyond, to be honest, I'm not trying to berate people. I'm just, I just want to recognize that these are things that I think about regularly, especially when I'm producing content, knowing that I, it could influence people, and sometimes in a negative and a positive way. And I can't always be of control of how other people feel, too. But it's just something that I think that we should think about and maybe even discuss. Lastly, you may have noticed that I, I have not come back to the IAS show in a very long time. And the last time I was here, I was admittedly really overwhelmed. I mean, it was, it, it's in a wonderful way, but also kind of one of those ways where there are people like sweating over plants and like pushing people over. It was a lot smaller than what it is now. So there's like more room to elbow. You don't have to elbow people. But it was, it was a bit, it was a bit crazy. I mean, I, I was here during the times when there was like 30 or 40 people. <laughs> and now there's like, 400 so it's kind of it's kind of nuts and it kind of reminded me that first time when I was here when it got really busy kind of reminded me of like the tickle me Elmo craze that happened back in 1996 I'm not sure how many folks recall that there I mean there's been obviously like more contemporary crazes like Apple iPhones or like supreme t-shirt lines or things like that 
But again, it kind of felt a little bit that way. I mean, people were grabbing at plants. I mean, it was, it was insane. So I know it's exciting, especially for people like Ron, who actually helped start the IAS and everything, and to see people's level of enthusiasm. Speaking with some of the folks here who have been at IAS for a while, they're like, the amount of enthusiasm, the amount of education, the amount of knowledge that so many folks has is awesome. But it made me really question that fine line between love and obsession. <laughs> and it is a fine line. And perhaps everyone in the audience here, including myself, have crossed that line over and back, over and back on so many occasions. But what is the difference between that love and that obsession? So in my opinion, that love will make you do things for people and places and things that you care about. So it'll make you do things for people and places and things that you care about. An obsession, on the other hand, will make you do things to people and places and things that you desire. So I think obsession might be rooted more in selfishness, and then love is rooted in selflessness. And this was something that people always, at least when those droves of journalists would, was coming into my house, I noticed a lot of journalists tried to say, so would you think that you're really obsessed? And I'm like, no. Like, I, like that, when I, I would never, like for me, maybe people from the outside would be like, that woman's obsessed. But knowing myself, I, I just don't have that in me. Like I don't feel, I don't ever felt like that was an adjective that I would describe myself as. And, and I thought that awareness was interesting because I was like, ooh, these people are actually trying to like promote that as well. And it, it, was, just, it was just kind of a really interesting thing as you're, as you're observing this. So that line of love and obsession, I really started to think about it, really for, and also for this talk as well. Um, OK, this is not exactly air, an aeroid, but does anybody know who this lovely young lady is from the history days? I wish Chad Husby was here. He always pulls these people out of his like noggin. Oh, she looks like it. Yeah, kind of same era. This is Princess Augusta. And Princess Augusta actually started the Kew Botanic, Royal Botanic Gardens. Yeah, I didn't even know it was a woman who started it. Did you guys know that? It's amazing. Oh, yeah, woman started Kew Botanic. I mean, she had predecessors that were starting to plant, but she was the one who actually had the germ of the seed to say, I want the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. Now, I think we could all relate to her statement here. And she said that the goal was essentially to acquire and display all plants of the world, <laughs> which is no small feat because, you know, I mean, right now we have maybe 390,000 plants, and I don't know how many were available to her back in the 1700s, but even though, I mean, it was a, it's a mighty mission, but it's safe to say that we've all felt just a little, just a little shadow of what Princess Augusta feels. <laughs> um, so I have highlighted plant smuggling on Plant Went On Me. And, and it was after actually speaking with Liz from Bee Willow. She has a plant shop down in Baltimore. And I was inspired to give a percentage of my Google AdSense proceeds to plant conservation every year. Because you may have read about Liz. You may not know Liz, but you may have read about her in the New York Times because there was a number of Chilean cacti in the genus Copiapoa, and they were poached. Sorry, it's like popping. They were poached, and they moved through Greece and Italy, and they needed like a few hundred bucks. They caught the poachers, and they just needed like a few hundred bucks to get these plants back into the ground. They, they wanted to send them back to Chile and to grow them back in the ground because there was still time to actually get them, and that doesn't usually happen. But otherwise, if they weren't going to get that few hundred bucks, they were just going to languish there in, the, uh, in, in custody. So Liz found this out, and she was able to donate a portion of her plant store sales to get those plants back into the ground and then continue to donate her plant sales. And, um, and it was just a really awe-inspiring story of what one little shop owner who was in, into plants could actually do. And it's a shame that you have to go and do that. Like, you'd rather not to have to spend the money to put the plants back in the ground, but it was, uh, you know, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes those plants will just languish there. So since COVID hit, you know, 
I don't have to remind you, the economies of the world shut down, people slid into the world of like plant smuggling, and the amount of plants being stolen really increased exponentially. And you will know that aeroids are probably not the most poached plants, and they might not be, you know, they're not the slowest growing species and things along those lines. Maybe there's a lot that we don't know because there hasn't been things that have like hit the, you know, the press yet, or the, there's, you know, po possible accusations and allegations, but there's nothing that, you know, has, has been um, in the press as much as cacti, succulents, and cycads, and that really steals the cake, and those are the most damning because those, you know, take a long time to grow. So just to give you an example, almost half of the world's threatened cacti are at risk of extinction due to poaching. So it's not habitat degradation or anything like that, it's more poaching. And that came from the Journal of Nature Plants. And this one actually was just published this year, earlier this year, and this is in the journal Taxon. I'll just read this out to you. Succulent plants from the wild in South Africa has developed into an enormous illegal industry with the number of such plants confiscated increasing by over 250%. So around, this is just in three years, 2020 to 2021, 1.5 million plants have been illegally removed from the wild just in three years. But after that stat came out, a few months later in one single case, there was three foreign nationals arrested in South Africa and they had 1.63 million plants. Just these three guys, 1.63 million plants, they surpassed what was stolen in the last three years. It was insane. As we know from this situation, plants from the wild, like these avonias right here, they don't survive. Many of us here have probably bought in some way, shape, or form a plant from the wild at some point. And we all know, even when you're trying to give it the best care, it may not survive. So the fact that some of these are just like languishing and they get caught, it's, it's just, it's impossible to do that. So if Liz didn't step in for the Copiapoa, many of those probably wouldn't have survived as well. And I think this really begs to make us wonder, I mean, raise your hand if you think you know the provenance of every single plant in your collection. And not like you got it from that guy, but like, where did that guy get it? How many of us could actually raise our hand? I can't. And I, I'm, I'm certain that I probably got something that was maybe not something that I would have loved to get. And um, I even think I bought something on Etsy that I was probably, that Etsy seller is no longer there. And I think that Etsy seller probably got um, in trouble for maybe confiscating some Dudleya because they had Dudleya on there, uh, so, which is another succulent that's out in California. So, you know, it, it's just one of those things where I think it's important for us. I'm not, I don't want to people, like, this is why I didn't want to be a Debbie Downer. I was like, Frank, are you really want me to talk about this? But I think it's a, an important topic to address and to really think about, you know, what is our role and, and how do we actually approach this being plant lovers and, and people who want to see this and maybe have this uh, interest in also maintaining where those plants are from and being more engaged. I think Liz was in, in a really good place where she's like, you know what, I, I sell plants for a living. Why don't I start doing something for plant conservation? These are things that I think that we uh, have a role in and we could actually play a big part in. So um, this interest actually brought me to uh, a team that was starting to do ba uh, Bad Seeds, which is a podcast. Now, I'm not going to be mad. How many people of you have not listened to Bad Seeds? OK, OK, there's, there's a few. So the people who have um, listened to it, I'm just going to play you a clip. And if I'm running late, I could actually shorten the clip as well. But uh, this is a, gives you an example. And Bad Seeds is about plant smuggling and plant theft. And it's kind of done more in the vein of like a true crime. Deep in the mountainous rainforest of southeastern Brazil, not far from the village of Domingos Marchings, grows a plant. Its stalks are long and narrow, a crown of dangling green. It grows out of the mist, below the canopy, slowly creeping up the trunks of trees. As it matures, it hangs above the ground like a chandelier, the blades of each leaf splayed like the wings of an angel. 
The plant's name is Philodendron spiritus sancti. Latin for Holy Ghost, it is one of the rarest plants in the world. Only a few specimens grow in the wild. To plant collectors, the words spiritus sancti elicit goosebumps. The plant's name is spoken with hushed religious reverence. Many call it the Holy Grail of philodendrons. It's only found in the wild in one small town in Brazil at this point, as far as we know. That's Dr. Ari Novi. He's the president and CEO of the San Diego Botanic Garden. A big part about why it has such value to collectors is it has very beautiful, long leaves. It looks fantastic, and it's incredibly hard to propagate. A botched cutting, for example, could kill the entire plant. And that's why captive Spiritus sancti specimens are best handled by professionals, people like Dr. Novi and the folks at the garden in San Diego. We have about 5,000, a little over 5,000 individual plant taxa or species that are represented within our collections. It is an ungodly (laughs) diversity of plants. This collection includes rare and endangered species like the Hawaiian hibiscus, a.k.a. Hibiscus rosa sinensis, the bastard quiver tree, or Aliodendron pilansii, and of course, the holy relic of southern Brazil. For years, the Spiritus Sancti was one of San Diego's centerpieces. It hangs high above the ground, delicately suspended from the greenhouse's ceiling, far out of reach of passersby. At least, that's what they thought. One morning in May 2020, a garden employee stepped into the greenhouse, peered up, and witnessed a blasphemy. Our director of horticulture at the time was in the, the garden, and he felt like that basket looked a little less full. Eventually got out of the ladder and climbed up and saw that this plant had been kind of hacked off. It became clear what had happened. In the dead of night, somebody had broken into the garden, grabbed a pole saw, or a long pair of loppers, and hacked off pieces of the treasured plant. The heist seemed meticulously planned. There were no signs of breaking or entering. There are other valuable plants in that space that they were not targeted. But it certainly seems like somebody was aware of our habits. You know, somebody was, for lack of a better term, kind of casing the joint for a while. The reason they targeted the Spiritus? Money. That was probably the single highest value plant in the collection of the Botanic Garden in terms of what you could get for resale value. This plant could sell for between ten dollars and $15,000 on the open market. $15,000. A Spiritus Sancti is more than a plant. It's a status symbol, an investment, a limited edition Rolex that knows photosynthesis. And that price tag has done much more than simply drain the pockets of rich plant lovers. It's fueled a spree of crime and lies and deceit. I'm Summer Rain Oaks. On this episode, a look inside a booming craze for houseplants and how a cultural obsession and the human instinct to keep up with the Joneses might be killing the things we love the most. From School of Humans and iHeart Podcasts, this is Bad Seeds. It's 2012, and a small crowd is gathered for the International Royd Society Fall Show and Sale in Florida. It's an annual banquet, and this year, Dr. Tom Crowett of the Missouri Botanical Garden and Tom Moore, founder of the Tropical Fern and Exotic Plant Society, are holding a plant they call the Pièce de Résistance. Okay. Mortgage your house, sell your children, and buy this plant. It's better than the stock market. It's a spiritus sancti, a small one, but a spiritus nonetheless. And then the bidding begins. Well worth your money tonight. Give me a $50 opening bid. 200. How much? 200. 200 up front. I got 200 up front over here. 300 over here. 300 over here. I got 400 in the back. I got 400 in the back. I got 400 in the back. You gonna let this go for $400? Of course not. The bids keep rising. 
500, 700, 900. I got 950. I got 950 to her 970. 970. I got 970. I got 970. I got 1,000. I got 1,000. I'm going to go 1,000 once, 1,000 twice. Sold. that gives you a little idea of what's going to happen tonight, you know. <laughs> Get you warmed up for that auction. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit of the bad seeds. And we highlight lending many different plants in the philodendron spirit of sanctity, which I actually learned about through Enid. That was actually um, something I learned about through Enid. I didn't even realize the, uh, the cult of the spirit of sanctity until her. Um, but this is an interesting thing. This is called a crime triangle. I'm just going to pull this up. This starts to help people think about like, okay, a crime has happened. What are we going to do about it? Because something like what happened in San Diego, what happens at botanic gardens, what happens at nurseries and also places in the wild, you have to start thinking like, well, how do I deal with this now? It's happening. So how do I deal with this? So the crime is in the center of the triangle. And then you have the offender and you have this triangle and you have the offender who's looking at a target in a specific place. And the way that they think about this is, okay, well, if you have the target, then you need a guardian there. If you have a place, then maybe you need some kind of wildlife manager, and a handler would be like law enforcement. So you're like, where do I spend my money? If I have to spend money on this, if I have to think about how I could curtail people from doing this type of thing, how do I, how do I deal with this? The one thing I think the crime triangle doesn't really address, and this is the thing that I, like, I feel really challenged by when thinking about these things and doing like a podcast like Bad Seeds, is really understanding why people do things. And I thought this is like a you know, really good exercise that maybe we could do together. And it's like going inside the mind. And I don't even want to say the criminal mind, because I think like We've all like picked plants out in the wild. Like even if it's just like a little kid picking a flower. Like I actually was recently on a uh, on a on a walk, and there was a kid who picked a trillium. And trillium is kind of like a rare plant up in up in the northeast. And the mother had to describe to the kid why you shouldn't pick the trillium. But kids are just naturally they want to pick flowers, you know that type of thing. So it's one of those things where it's not like that kid is a, a criminal. And I don't want to say that because there's so many different reasons why plants like people will have theft or smuggle or just take a plant. And if we could just role play, and I have, an, I have a list, I'm, not, I'm just going to say, why are some things, that, why, why would some people actually smuggle or thieve a plant? Like, what are some of the, the reasons? Status. Status, okay. Money, Money privilege, pretty. pretty. Obsession. Obsession. Anything else? Okay, mental illness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, so here are some of my uh, categories. Because I thought a lot about this. Economic. You want to support yourself or your family. Maybe it's the only business in town. Diversify your revenue. It's a get-rich scheme. Selfishness or self-interest. Maybe it's the excitement and the thrill. You know, just that type of thing. The discovery, the newness. I mean, we've all been in a place and you see a new plant. The bottle link for me was like discovery. There's a lot there, so why not take some? Um, fulfill one's collection, be cool, show off, clout, part of the club, peer pressure. Maybe it's a savior complex. I think some, some of us might feel that way. If you don't do it, someone else will. You're the best person to take care of it. And then it's in the name of science. Um, it's getting removed anyway. And these might not all be bad things. The reason why I'm doing this is because if you're kind of trying to deal with theft, but you don't understand why folks are actually doing it, then you're just kind of throwing a Band-Aid on it. You want to get down to the root of it. Lack of knowledge, maybe people are unaware. A cultural thing, maybe some people use it ethnobotanically. They use it for household con uh, uh, consumption, traditional rights. It's recreational. You know, you go out, you pick some ginseng, you're foraging for ginseng. Poaching as rebellion because you're like, I don't agree with this. A disagreement with the regulations as well. So that's all kind of related. And the reason why I bring this up is because I have a friend who's in Thailand, Anders Lindstrom, and he is kind of, he has propagated like millions of cycads. He runs an amazing program program at this like kind of like theme park in Thailand. Um, it's bizarre, but they do plant conservation on the back end. And there is a place in Africa. And they started to pilfer plants, like pilfer cycads. And it was the only cycad. This is the only area where the cycad exists. I don't remember the species name. And they went there and they, they said, why are you, 
why, local people, are you actually stealing your CICAD and selling it out to high bidders? And they said, well, you know what? We don't have a school in the area, and we have to send our kids to school, and so we have to get you know, the, the money, and we have to get the shoes, and we have to get the books. And so they decided, Anders and his, his folks at, uh, with the CICAD Society decided to actually spend money on building a school there, paying for the teachers, and the theft stopped. And they actually started to educate the students about the importance of these CICADs in the landscape. And, and that's a great example that if you were to just have a handler and a, uh, to get to the offender, and you're throwing these parents and these kids in jail because they want to spend these kid, you know, want to send the kids to school, you have to start to see that the, this is really nuanced in certain areas of the world. So I, I just wanted to bring this up to show that these are things that I think are a little bit challenging for people to kind of address when we start to think about it. One of the things that was most revealing when I was doing Bad Seeds is how organized actually plant smuggling has become. So just like human trafficking or drugs or illegal arms deals, much of the plant poaching, the large scale plant poaching that's happening in the world is organized by crime syndicates. So it doesn't matter if it's avocados, a lot of our avocados are through the cartel, um, cacti or opioids like poppies from Afghanistan. Criminals are really exploiting these legal loopholes, and a lot of that is also happening from high levels of government. And that was one of the things that was like mind-blowing to me, because I think the economic or the cultural end of things, if somebody can't afford and they're, they're going out to plant smuggle for that reason, or if it's happening in the highest levels of government in conjunction with kind of the cartels of the world, that's also one that I don't really have answers to, I mean, quite frankly. So I think those are some of the, the personal challenges that I was saw, I saw. And even in, like Afghanistan's an interesting one. If you look at it from the, the opium poppy world, it's the world's largest opium and heroin producer. And in 1984, they were already supplying like 60% to the US market and 80% of the European market with that drug. And then the first wave of the, that opioid crisis in the US happened in the 1990s. And so I always, I'm, I'm now a little bit more skeptical. I'm like, why is our government there? <laughs> you know, what, what, is, what is our stake in that? And, I, and so I, I started to look into this a little bit more and it started to shock me how much, especially when you go to travel to some of those areas, like I spend a lot of time in Mozambique and I have a friend who served in the South African Army, he's now in plant conservation right now, and the amount of organized trade that happens there through whether it's like logging or whether it's like children is stunning. And he's, he's one of those people that really opened my eyes to this. And if you have those systems in place, if you have the methods to actually ship, it does not matter if it's avocados or AK-47s or uh, opioids or children. It actually happens along a lot of the same things. And that was one of the most revealing aspects that I found when we were doing Bad Seeds and then I was able to kind of bring in some of those conversations from the past. So as much as I think we see maybe people that we see on like Etsy or maybe we see some folks on Instagram or folks on Facebook and all these things and it looks like some individuals are doing it, there could be, but it, I just wanna raise your attention that this is actually far more organized in some ways than, than what we actually know about. And it's, it's hard to go into that world because it's so dark and a lot of our minds don't go there. Like the plant world is happy, you know, it's like that type of thing. But when you start to like reveal the underbelly of it, it starts to get very dark very quickly. Some things that I think are actually more relevant even to folks in this room what I found also in science journals, and I, I, I like to delve into some science, science journals and look at some of the latest plants and everything that are being discovered. And what they also found is that plant junkies have become so obsessed in, and interested in certain genera of plants that they will start to keep tabs on the latest scientific discoveries. So if a botan, botanist finds a new species of plants, and I think this is, what's the, these are cryptochironies? 
Corey? Yeah, Corey? Yeah, okay, so this is, this is one that I even found a Facebook group for. Like, people are obsessed with this little plant. There's like new ones being discovered in the Philippines all the time. And what I started to notice is that in these science journals, people are not saying where these plants are found anymore. And also what I've noticed is that as the herbaria are starting to get digitized in this world, so the, there's, I've, I've gone to a number of different um, herbariums, they're starting to digitize all that, all that location data on plants is becoming more and more publicly available, which is great for researchers and it's great for plant enthusiasts who want to go to do plant tourism and they want to see plants in the wild. But the people who are becoming obsessed with stealing these plants in the wild, they've begun using those waypoints to locate and remove plants from the wild. Additionally, many uh, scientists and citizen scientists are using apps like iNaturalist. How many have used iNaturalist at some point? Okay. So it's a great app. But you could actually locate plants with the GPS coordinates and find plants in the wild. So if you find something that's rare or economically viable or valuable, then people begin to target that plant. So I've started to see more things like this. Actually, I think this was one of the research articles that came out of MOBA. I think Mar Monica Carlson worked on this. But it, it said, due to lack of population level information, we suggest a provisional category of data deficient. And this is on Anthurium caldazii. It grows in some protected areas, and it faces illegal collection by the surrounding communities due to its high ornamental value. More work is needed to fully assess the conservation status of the species. And then owing to the ornamental potential of a plant, we are withholding the exact locality in order to protect wild populations from commercial poaching. So I am starting to see this more of like scientists who are starting to just basically take back some of that information. And I think, unfortunately, you know, it's like the bad apple spoils the rest. It, we don't necessarily benefit from that. We don't necessarily benefit from those types of things. And uh, I think that's unfortunate. But it also, you know, should we do it for the protection of the plant? That's something to raise. Now, I'd promise to sink back more to some of those um, personal stories of uh, pollination. And one of the things that we don't know, like within the Eraci, is pollination systems, this one came out, a recent research article, pollination systems are unknown in more than half of the aeroid genera with bisexual flowers. So more than half, like there's so much that we don't know. If like these plants are being taken or if they, they're, whether they're being thieved or smuggled or if it's actually habitat degradation at the end of the day, there's so much that we don't know. Those little connections between those bees and the bugs and the stoneflies of the world, we just don't know all of what we're doing. So I thought this was actually an interesting graph, and this just looks at like the evolution of pollination modes in the Eraci. So you have pollinator orders to the left, and then you, like bees and flies and beetles and things, they don't have the stonefly up there. And then you have like these pollination types on the right. So these are specialists in many cases that are highly targeted to those specific plants within that genus. Here's a great example. More than 90% of the inflorescences were exclusively pollinated by one species of scarab beetle, and this is the, the Philodendron acutatum, and this is cyclocephala. And I don't really study this as much as in subtropical and tropical genera, but cyclocephala seems like one of those beetles that really focuses on philodendron flowers. So it's one of those ones that specializes, and if you, you take that all out, there goes that beetle. So this is the little guy, that's what he looks like. He obviously is like much larger on this screen, but they're very tiny guys. <laughs> and then you have, um, I wish Tom was here. Is this a philodendron or a thematophyllum? Tom would not know. He, he, says, he, he now thinks that thematophyllum doesn't exist. <laughs> so whatever you think it is, um, this one is uh, in East Brazil and it's endemic to that area, and it depends on the presence of one insect, and that is Aerocellus emarginata. It's its sole pollinator. So it's the only insect that pollinates this plant. This is what it looks like. Again, it's usually very tiny. So these are all really complex, co-evolved relationships that we may be disrupting. We don't know. Like whether it's habitat degradation, whether it's theft, whether it's smuggling, these are things that we need to think about, and I think getting into that natural history of the plant, getting more involved in plant conservation, and just being more aware in general really help. Um, some of the solutions that I saw that are out there, 
Botanic gardens and nurseries, they're installing more cameras. That's the, like, I, th I feel like the least that they could do. Uh, they're keeping their rarer plants, unfortunately not in the open to the public, but more behind lock and key and out of the views of the public. I have also seen rarer and pricier plants at nurseries in cages. <laughs> so even staff or passersby can't get sticky fingers. Uh, I've seen some facilities start to propagate rarer plants to move rare plants into tissue culture labs to begin more flooding the market basically to decrease any of the demand on those plants. Um, there are also folks out there who are currently right now looking to legally fix the problem. So this is on the lawyer end. Many of the poaching regulations were done for an, like wildlife and animal. And so they don't, that doesn't really carry over to plants all the time. So oftentimes, if you steal a plant, you'll get like a slap on the hand and a $100 fine. So now they're trying to do stiffer regulations and uh, you know even put jail time and everything. Those things are going to take some time. But that's some of the regulations that people are talking about on the legal end of things. And then we also know that plant conservation and regulation is woefully underfunded. So there's also some things that are happening in the geospatial technology world where they're employed to kind of figure out the best way to spend money. So this is an example of what's happening in Shenandoah National Park. So they have a lot of poaching risk on American ginseng, which has a national and international market. And they found that through geospatial technology, they found that more of the people are poaching, obviously, around where it's easier access to roads. So they started to look at, on a map, where is the accessibility? Where are we going to spend our funds to deal with this? So where there's more roads, where it's more accessible, they're going to be putting more managers there in those areas. So I think those things are really helpful when you're looking at a landscape level to figure out how am I going to deal with this. Um, we're starting to see some changes on iNaturalist as well. It's not really quite there yet, but some plant scientists and taxonomists are now not sharing as much data, and iNaturalist has put in some uh, interesting tools for them to be able to cover up some of the GPS coordinates for rare plants and other species. And for governmental interventions, I think it'll just involve a sea change. <laughs> I mean, part of it is getting better elected officials in government, but it's also like willing to stand up and try to figure out where, like, I mean, it is just, I don't even know where to start there. I mean, it, it's, it's a hard one. But I think what we could do is just really focus on the positive impacts that we can make. I mean, we love plants, we love plants, we don't want it to like, you know, ruin, uh, ruin our day when, when like, uh, you know, things like, I, I don't want you to go back home feeling like super guilty. I, I hate it, I hate that Summer actually talked tonight because now I feel bad, I guess plants suck. But um, no, I think it, we should feel empowered and we should start asking some more of those questions and collectively look for changes. I mean, I know IES has even started to focus more on, focus on conservation and kind of taking steps to say, making sure that some of the purveyors here are doing it in a way that is far more ethical. And even if something is wild collected, you know, it's just like foraging. People go out and like forage plants and some people could rip out all the ramps that they're foraging or rip out all the ginseng, but there's also proper ways to forage in the wild as well. And, maybe thinking about that as when we think about our wild plants. Um, in the end, I think like it's our shared responsibility and there's shadowy forces out there everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't think any of us wanna fancy ourselves as like plant thieves or plant smugglers, but the reality is when nobody could raise their hand to understand the provenance of the plants, it is something that I think that we have the responsibility to, uh, uh, to take into account and to really think through those things. So I hope this gave you a lot to think about. Thank you guys for sitting through it and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.